Do you realize that virtually any time of the day there are thousands of airplanes in the sky? I bet the Wright brothers never dreamed that that would happen. I'm Keith and I'm glad you're joining us today for an amazing look at how airplanes fly. You gotta tell me action! <laughs> It was once thought, according to science, that bumblebees shouldn't be able to fly. Because their wings were so small, and their bodies so big, yet they fly. I don't know about you, but I look at these huge airplanes and I wonder, how in the world do they get off the ground? Now you may not know this, that's why I'm here to tell you, airplanes weren't always around. They didn't always look like this. You should see some of the crazy contraptions that people came up with when they were trying to figure out how to fly. Check this out, it's amazing. Did you know Joe and Jacques Montgolfier discovered that hot air was lighter than cool air? So much for being cool. You may think I'm just messing around. I know your parents may have told you to keep your arms and legs inside of a moving vehicle. Good advice, Mom. But be that as it may, you are witnessing two of the very forces of flight. Right, 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 right before your very eyes. Out. When my hand is tilted against the wind, it takes the shape of an airfoil, which is a fancy science name for the wing of an airplane. The air moves faster over the top of my hand than it does under the palm. This makes lower pressure on top and higher pressure underneath, creating what we call lift. The higher pressure underneath pushes my hand up against the lower pressure on top. This works just like the wings of an airplane. The car acts like the plane's engine, pushing it through the air. This is what we call thrust. The faster the engine pushes the plane, the greater the thrust, which generates greater lift, pushing the airplane up into the sky. When we come back, we'll take a look at the other two forces of flight, weight and drag. Did you know? In 1793, the Montgolfier brothers launched the first passenger flight of a hot air balloon. Who were the passengers? A sheep, a rooster, and a duck. I don't even know what to say about that. I have no clue if birds can fly or not. Birds fly because they have wings with no holes in them. That's a weird question. I mean, I know they can fly, but... <laughs> hey guys, we're at the Municipal Airport in Marion, Indiana. Right over there is my friend Tim Helm. He's working on the pre-flight check before we go up in the air. Could you imagine if you had your own airplane? I mean, if he were your dad, you would say, Hey dad, can I have the keys to the plane instead of the keys to the car? Well, Tim's going to let us take a look at his plane, so let's go meet him, all right? Hey, Tim, how you doing? Hi, Keith. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Thanks for sharing with sure, us. Sure. Glad to. Hey, it's a great-looking airplane. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Oh, sure. sure. It's a Cessna 172, high wing. It's got a 150-horsepower engine. Uh, we'll cruise along in a few minutes at about 110 miles an hour. Tell me about what makes this thing fly. Well, it starts with the propeller, okay. like a giant fan, 
that generates a lot of wind. And the wind then comes over the wing. And the shape of the wing separates the air and basically creates a vacuum. And the vacuum, or, or low pressure air above the wing, gives it lift and makes it glide through the air. As long as the fan's running, we fly. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what about steering? There are three ways that you have to steer a plane. The first is what we call our aileron, which is right here. You see how it moves, and it makes the, the plane bank or roll. And you make it roll by turning the yoke left and right, just like a steering wheel. And then over here, Keith, we have what we call the rudder. This is the back part of the tail. It turns like this. You operate the rudder inside the cockpit with your foot pedals, left and right. And that makes the plane yaw or turn, just like a car would turn left and right. And then this is the elevator. The elevator makes the plane pitch up and down, and you do that by pulling your yoke back or forward. Hey, Tim, could you show us the inside of the airplane? Yeah, sure. Keith, this is the inside of the cockpit. This is what we call our yoke. Turning it like a steering wheel in a car makes the aileron cause the plane to bank. Pulling it towards you or away from you operates the rudder, makes the plane pitch up and down. And then the pedals, you may not be able to see them, the foot pedals turn the rudder and makes the plane yaw, just like a car turns left and right. This is what we call the throttle. Makes it go fast or slow. This is the fuel mixture ratio. You can uh, run the engine with a very lean gas mixture or a very rich gas mixture. And then these are all the dials that tell us how fast we're going, how high we are, how fast the engine's running, our direction, and then what we call our attitude indicator, which tells us if we're flying straight and level or not. Um, 
And then this is our tachometer, which tells us how fast the engine is turning. Okay. Great, thank you for that. Smooth. It's really a beautiful day for flying. Looks like we made it. Did you know? December 17, 1903, Orville Wright piloted the Kitty Hawk Flyer 120 feet in 12 seconds for the first heavier-than-air flight. How amazing is that? We are momentarily bringing this program to a screeching halt in order to provide you with this completely irrelevant yet tastefully reverent presentation. Hi, I'm Chris, and this is my talent. <laughs> That's all I got. Hi, I'm Courtney. And I'm Cassie, and I'm going to get inside a suitcase. And I'm going to help her. <laughs> hey, man, I am Stephanie Beavis, and I'm going to walk through a broom. Hi, I'm uh, Phil Lambert, and um, I guess I have a couple talents, so here we go. Uh, this is the first one. Oh! Hi, my name is Phil, and I've got a joke for you. How do you sell a chicken to a hearing impaired lady? Hey, lady, do you want to buy a chicken? <laughs> my name is Donald Jordan, and I can catch corn dogs in my mouth. A long time ago, there was this guy, Sir Isaac Newton, and he came up with this thing called the Third Law. Now, the Third Law states that for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. What does that mean? Uh, good question. It means that whenever a force is applied to an object, there's an equal and opposite force applied back by that object. For example, when you walk on the ground, your feet are pushing down on the ground. At the same time, the ground is pushing up on your feet. Or, when you're sitting in a chair, your body is pushing down on the chair, and the chair is pushing up on your body. It's the same with an airplane. Where there is thrust, there's the opposite force, drag. Where there is lift, again there is the opposite, weight, or gravity. It takes all four forces to make flight possible. Man, I am tired of being pushed around. in the air is probably gravity. I don't know how airplanes can fly or a certain kind of gas or something like that. An airplane stays in the air because they have wings and fans. Did you know? Otto Lilienthal, a German engineer, developed the first hang glider that could be piloted by a human in the early 1800s. That ought to be smooth sailing. I'm with the Kentucky Air National Guard at the Louisville International Airport. I'll introduce you to a friend of mine, Captain Sean Dolly. He is the pilot of this huge plane. Do you want to meet him? All right. Hey, Sean. Hey, Keith. How you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Good. Sean, could you tell me, how did, how did you get started as a pilot? Well, right after high school, I joined the Air Force, and I was an aircraft mechanic for four years. Mm -hmm. Was going to night school, earned a degree, and then the Air Force decided to send me to pilot training. What kind of planes have you, uh, have you flown? Well, in addition to this big one, I flew, uh, flew two smaller jets in pilot training, the T-37 and the T-44, which, though not quite as big, were still challenging because they're the first ones I flew. Nice. What, uh, how long have you been in the Guard? I've been in the Air National Guard now for 12 years, and I was active duty for four years prior to that. Nice, nice. You've been all over the world, haven't you? Yeah, uh, which is not atypical. Most people, I know that at least the Kentucky Air National Guard stays quite busy, and uh, mm -hmm. this unit's been to every continent, uh, sometimes uh, 
more than one or two times. Yeah. And we've been very active in both Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom. Oh, nice. We appreciate you, that's for sure. We've looked at some smaller planes, and could you tell us uh, about some of the differences and maybe some of the similarities of the planes? Sure, absolutely. And there's probably a lot more similarities than most people realize. Uh, whether the plane is big or small, all the same aerodynamic principles that were discussed earlier come into play. It has two wings, it has a tail section, it has at least one engine to make it go forward, and it creates the lift that the small planes need to go airborne just as well. Great. You mind if we take a look? Absolutely. That'd be great. So we're in a C-130. Sean, what is the C-130 used for? Just about everything. The C-130's been in production now for over 50 years, and for good reason. This particular aircraft here at the Kentucky Air Guard, we've used to airdrop personnel into drop zones. We've airdropped equipment, like we have here behind us, to resupply troops in combat. And uh, once the aircraft is empty, if we're able to land somewhere, oftentimes we reconfigure the cargo compartment and haul out litter patients, those who've been wounded or perhaps even worse. Okay. Um, what? What, what's in this here? That? Yeah, I can't tell you. Oh. So what is an airdrop? Well, preferably we'd like to land everywhere we go, shut the engines down, take our time, relax, and offload the cargo using forklifts and things of that nature. But if the airfield is not secure enough or we need to resupply people who are not near an airfield, we essentially airdrop stuff out the back of the aircraft. We have people here on the ground who configure these types of loads as you see here behind us. And our load masters are the guys that fly in the back of the aircraft. And we essentially have chutes attached to them, parachutes that is. Mm -hmm. And once we're at that magic point in space, we hit a button, the chute goes out, and it pulls the load out with it. Sean, could you uh, tell us a little bit about this area? Yeah, you bet. Just another look at the cargo compartment, which can accommodate either a lot of equipment, such as tanks, or a lot of people. We can carry up to 92 individuals, although it's somewhat of a tight fit. It's not the leg room we'd have in first class flying in an airliner. <laughs> right. But uh, if we typically have paratroopers, guys that are loaded up with a lot of equipment, rucksacks, mm -hmm. weapons, we can carry usually about 50 to 60, somewhere in that neighborhood. So this will carry a tank? It can. Uh, not all of them, but uh, enough of them. We can usually fit one smaller tank inside the aircraft. And they can carry up to about 40 or 50,000 pounds. Okay, great. Now I noticed your parachute's here. Mm -hmm. um, and this is called a static line? That's correct. Okay. Sometimes the guys just uh, run off the ramp behind us here. <laughs> and once they get out, you know, they deploy their own parachute. Other times the guys jump out and their parachute is attached via a tether to the static line so it automatically deploys their chute for them. And we use those uh, typically at lower altitudes. Okay. Can we see the cockpit? No. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. You know, this, this panel here just looks so intimidating. Could you tell us just a little bit about it? Well, certainly. You know, the first time that I put my eyes on it, I was, uh, to say the least, quite intimidated myself. Well, like I mentioned outside, despite the size of the aircraft, it has many more similarities with smaller airplanes than one may realize. Mm -hmm. Common to this aircraft and all aircraft are things such as your airspeed indicator, your attitude indicator, engine instrument performance instrumentation, an altitude indicator to let you know how okay. high above the ground you are. And you'll find these in every type of aircraft. You have to have this basic equipment to essentially maintain your awareness about where you are and where you're going. Without it, if you went into a cloud, you'd be pretty in big, pretty big trouble. Sean, thank you so much for showing us the plane. We really, really appreciate you and appreciate your service and well, everything you that you do. thank you very much. I mean on behalf that. of the men and women of the Kentucky Air National Guard, thank you for coming yeah, out. That's great. Did you know? On July 20, 1969, Neil Armstrong was the first man to walk on the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And he discovered that it wasn't made of cheese.
Right now we are at Fort Knox. We just flew in from Stanford on a C-130 and they in about seven minutes are going to come around and drop a 20 pound sandbag on this thing right here. I think they can do it. Okay, hey Pete, you stand right there at that thing right there. You want me to stand right here? Right there is where you stand. It's big and orange. Hi, yeah, professor. it's like a big orange cone-like thing. Before your very eyes. It's got a 150 horsepower engine. And we'll cruise along the lift. Airplanes are amazing things. You know, just the fact that they can get off the ground is crazy. It makes me think of that scripture in the Bible, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or the other one where Jesus says, with man it's impossible, but with God, all things are impossible. If man can figure out how to fly and get a massive airplane off the ground, imagine what you can do with Jesus living in you. You think about that the next time you see an airplane flying overhead because that's amazing. And as our neighbors to the south say, good day. <laughs> I'm gonna tell me about this. Can I take it for a spin? No. Can I be goose and you be maverick? Absolutely not. <laughs> Can we buzz the tower? No. Roger that. Where the magic happens. Hey, hope he doesn't ask me about why my weight is. <laughs> 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 okay.
Okay, just think if he was your dad. And you, and you say, Dad, could I have the <laughs> Could I have the <laughs> <laughs> We just got an up close what? Why don't we reverse roles? Have him. <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay, I'm done. Sean Dolly, Sean Dolly, Captain Sean Dolly. Just imagine if you were your dad, you would be asking him for the keys to the airplane rather than the keys to the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Man!